ahead. Good morning, Officer Miller. Thanks for coming out today. Just as a preliminary matter, would you mind stating and spelling for us your full name? Uh, it's Matthew T. Miller, M-A-T-T-H-E-W. T is for Tyler, T-Y-L-E-R, and Miller is M-I-L-L-E-R. Have you ever gone by any other names? No. Where are you currently employed? Uh, with the City of Buckeye through the Buckeye Police Department. How long have you been employed by the City of Buckeye? A little over three years. Do you recall the month you started? October. And that would have been what, 2013? 12. 12, right. We just started 2016. Where did you work before that? I worked for the Grable Police Department in Grable, Wyoming. G-R-E-Y-B-U-L-L? -L. That's correct. How long were you there? I started there in 2005. When did you terminate that employment relationship? When I moved to Arizona. And that would have been October 2012? That's correct. Prior to Grable, where were you employed? Uh, I was employed with the Bighorn County Sheriff's Department. Also in Wyoming? Yes. What did you do there? Uh, I was a deputy sheriff um, and also a detention deputy working in the jail. When did you begin that employment? September um, of 2005. When did you sever your employment or rather begin your employment with Grable? Uh, right around the first of the year going into 2006. So okay, it's so like December, January-ish? Yes, sir. Am I correct then you, you worked as a deputy with Bighorn for just a short period of time, September to December or so. That's correct. How old were you then when you started with Bighorn? Probably 23. Before you started with Bighorn, what, uh, what did you do? Uh, I worked for the Sublet County Sheriff's Department in Wyoming. I'm sorry, which county? Sublet, S-U-B-L-E-T-T-E. -T -T -E. What position? I was a detention deputy working in the jail. When did you start that employment? In April of 2003. So that would have been about 21? Yes. And what did you do before that? Um, I had just a few odd jobs from the time I got out of high school until that time. Any, any military service? No, sir. Before you started uh, on your career in law enforcement, did you take any um, educational courses or training specifically related to law enforcement? Uh, not necessarily. Maybe basic, like government classes in high school. Then once you began first at Sublet, let's talk about that a little bit. Did you go through some sort of training program once you were hired there? I went through an eight-week academy. What was that called? The Detention Officer Basic Academy. Was that the material there just related to what your duties as a detention officer at the jails would have been? Yes. Okay. When you moved over to Bighorn, did you have any additional training? No. Okay. How about when you went to Graybull? Graybull was a police department, right? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> did you have any additional training when you went over to Graybull? Shortly after I was hired, I, I attended a Peace Officer Basic Academy. How long was that? Uh, a little over three months. Three months? Yes, sir. That's a long time. Was that, uh, do you remember what that training was called, or was it called anything other than just Peace Officer Basic? That's what it was called. Okay. Did you have any further training when you came over to the city of Buckeye? <clears throat> Moving to the state of Arizona, you, as what they call a lateral transfer. Mm -hmm. um, you then just have to challenge the Arizona Post, take the Arizona Post challenge test, which then certifies you in the state of Arizona. Okay, so basically when you came over, you essentially just took a test to make sure that you knew everything already to their satisfaction rel relative to Arizona law, and that was it. That's correct. Did you take any kind of study course, preparation course, anything like that? Um, in preparation for the post challenge test? No, I didn't. Did you review any of the post materials, post training materials? Uh, I reviewed Arizona statute, um, certain things just pertinent to Arizona. 
on my own. And correct me if I'm wrong, but that would have been in or around October 2012? That's correct. Did you take that post-challenge uh, test before you were hired on here? No. Okay, so they hired you and then you took the test? Yes. And presumably, I, I see you're here today in full uniform, you passed that test? Yes. Okay. Did you pass it on your first attempt? I did. Let's talk a little bit about um, your training, education, and experience, specifically as it relates to the job that you do now as a police officer. In your training, and we can go all, all the way back um, to your very first law enforcement job with the sheriffs, do you recall ever being trained about the constitutional rights that inure to the benefit of us, the citizens? Objection the form of the question. And all that means is I've made an objection for the record to hold this place, um, but I have not instructed you not to answer, so you answer the best you can. From time to time, you'll hear me say either objection form, objection foundation, or form and foundation. I'm simply noting a place in the record to be addressed with the court later on outside the presence of the jury. Okay? Okay. Did you repeat your question? So stipulated, whatever, whenever either uh, defense attorney makes an objection, it applies across the board to everybody. That way we don't have to muddy things up. Okay. Cool. Can I have a question we read? Sorry. In your training, and we can go all the way back to your very first law enforcement job with the sheriffs, do you recall ever being trained about the constitutional rights that you to the benefit of us, the citizens? Yes. Okay. Did you learn that your conduct as a law enforcement officer is restricted or limited in some way by those constitutional rights that you've learned about? Yes. Okay. I'd like to focus for a moment just specifically on the Fourth Amendment. Are you familiar with what that is? I am. Okay. And what's your understanding um, regarding the impact of the Fourth Amendment on the work that you do as a police officer? I believe the Fourth Amendment covers a citizen's rights to uh, I, I don't know how it's worded exactly, but unreasonable search and seizure. Okay. And I, I understand that. Um, it might have been a while since you actually have been in a position where you needed to go back and, and you know, review constitutional law or the training related to that. So just for purposes of today, I'm not looking for verbatim what your training was or anything like that or what the Constitution says. It's just your best recollection and understanding of the limitations that are imposed on you in the work that you do. And however you need to express that is perfectly fine as long as we can, you know, work back and forth so that we have a mutual understanding of what you're talking about. It's perfectly okay. So don't feel hesitant just because you don't know the exact words. It's perfectly okay. So on the Fourth Amendment, is it your understanding that the Fourth Amendment guarantees that citizens will not be subjected to unreasonable searches and seizures, or seizures, without due process of law? That's correct. Okay. There's some exceptions to that general rule, though, correct? Yes. Okay. Is exigency one of those exceptions? Objection to form and foundation. Yes, Base, it is. Let's back up a little bit. You talked to me a little bit about this training that you had first at the um, Sublet Sheriffs, then Bighorn Sheriffs, and Gray Bowl, and then the post-test that you took when you came to Arizona, right? Yes. As part of those trainings, and I, I'm not sure it really matters which one, but somewhere in those many trainings, did you learn about the exceptions to the general warrant rule? I did. Okay. So sitting here today as part of your job duties, do you feel fairly comfortable with your knowledge and understanding of what those exceptions are? Yes. Okay. Is one of those exceptions exigency? Yes. And based on your training and experience, what does that mean? Exigency would be um, some sort of circumstance that 
something uh, negative would happen if if an officer didn't in inject himself into that situation. If you didn't inject yourself immediately, right away. That's correct. Okay, so it's sort of like, and at any point, if I'm sort of summarizing or expressing what I'm understanding you to say, if I say it wrong or it doesn't jive with your understanding, stop me, let me know that I've made an error or a mistake or a misstating, and we'll try to resolve that, okay? Yes? Yes. Okay. So if I'm understanding you correctly, what you've been trained and what you apply in your work with respect to the exception to the general rule against seizing somebody, for example, is that an exigency would be some emergent circumstance, something that's, that's potentially an emergency, somebody's going to get hurt or severely injured if you don't step in right away to stop it. Is that a fair summary? Objection to form and foundation. Yes. Okay. And the injury that we're talking about in terms of you know, that exigency exception to the rule, am I correct that that would be something that has a high risk of causing severe bodily injury to somebody or death in the time within which it would take to get a warrant? Objection to form of foundation. Just based on your training. Can we repeat that? Sure. Please. And the injury that we're talking about in terms of, you know, that ex exigency exception to the rule, am I correct that that would be something that has a high risk of causing severe bodily injury to somebody or death in the time within which it would take to get a warrant? Uh, it certainly could be one of those two things, yes. Okay. Are there other circumstances, and let's just restrict it to the moment, actually let's back up a little bit. Have you had any training with respect to the constitutional rights that run between parents and children? I don't recall specific training to those. Okay, and, and that goes all the way back from um, sublet, you, you didn't have training about any of the rights that run between parents and children. I don't recall that. Okay, and then the training that you had in relation to your job at Bighorn, you, didn't, you don't recall having any training with respect to the rights that run between parents and children? That's correct. And am I also correct that the city of Buckeye, when you came over there, they didn't give you any training with respect to the constitutional rights that run between parents and children? That's correct. Okay. Do you have any understanding at all, based on what you've learned in any of these various law enforcement positions, including the city of Buckeye. Do you have any understanding at all about any restrictions that might apply to your ability to remove a child from its parents' custody? Objection to form and foundation. I'll have to have you repeat it. Sorry. Sure. Do you have any understanding at all, based on what you've learned in any of these various law enforcement positions, including the city of Buckeye, do you have any understanding at all about any restrictions that might apply to your ability to remove a child from its parents' custody? And if you don't understand the question or you're not sure, let me know that and we'll do some other stuff and try and figure out. We yeah, can, we could rephrase it or... Yeah, that's, that's right. perfectly fine. Let, let's go back a little bit, because you brought some materials with me, and I think that may help you maybe focus and try and get into the same mode that I'm in and what I'm thinking about. So let's start with looking at Exhibit A. That's your notice of deposition. Have you seen this document before? Um, let me see here. <clears throat> yes. Okay. When is the last time that you saw the document? Uh, I believe I looked at it this morning in reference to the address oh, on how oh, to get here. That makes sense. <laughs> okay. When is the first time, if you recall? And you can just give me an estimate if it was a week ago, 10 days, a month. A week. A week ago. And when you looked at this document, did you read it? I didn't read it word for word. No. Did you at least skim through it? Yes. Okay. And you noticed on uh, page two of the document that we were requesting that you bring some documents with you here today, correct? Specifically on page two, where, where at? Uh, you know, it's numbered, Just page, all of the... it's numbered page one, but it's actually this, if you turn back one page. That's my fault. 
there you go. It's numbered page one, but it's the second page of Exhibit A. You know, so let me know. I know Council's not asking for that, but in preparation, when you've met with um, Buckeye's attorney, who's defending Buckeye and all of its uh, employees that may be deposed, he's not asking you to go into right. any of those conversations. Those conversations are privileged by the attorney-client privilege. He's simply asking you about a document if you've seen it, but you're not to give any uh, testimony with regard to things you said. You met with attorney Mizrahi, who is uh, my partner and was here yesterday at depositions. And so I just want to caution you not to get into anything that was protected by the attorney-client privilege. You understand okay. what I'm saying? Yes. Okay. And that's a totally appropriate statement. I'm not, I'm not looking for anything that transpired between you and counsel. What I'm looking for really is just what you yourself may have done or brought or looked at. So if, you know, by some happenstance we start talking about a conversation that might have happened with an attorney, just stop and let me know that. Okay. And then we'll just move on. So going back to uh, this page one, which is the second page of Exhibit A, towards the bottom at line 21, you see in big bold letters, documents to be produced. Yes. Was it your understanding that we were asking you to um, search for, and if you found them, produce documents here today at the deposition? Yes. Okay. And you've actually done that, and I appreciate it. Your attorney handed me, uh, just before we started, two documents. One will mark as exhibit number 80, the other one as exhibit number 81. Okay, let's start with exhibit number 80. It's a multi-page document. It actually looks like it might be several different documents sort of all attached in one packet. So let's just sort of go through them one at a time. What is uh, page one of Exhibit 80. Uh, it looks like a, a form that would be submitted to AZ Post okay. regarding some training that I may have attended. Okay. And do you mind if I just, because we only have one copy, do you mind if I move over there next to you sure. so I can sort of look over your shoulder? And I think for this part, it's, a, it's okay if we're on video. I, I just want to get an understanding of what we're looking at. Um, so here where it says confirmation date, would that be the date that you took the training, if you know? Oh, I see, September 22nd. So it would have been a two-day training, basically. Yes. And it related to, oh, oh, I see, integrity-centered leadership. I got gotcha. you. And then if we go to the next page of Exhibit 80, what is that? Uh, a similar form, just probably in a... Different format? Yes. And this one here, I guess you signed them both. Okay. When you do these trainings, um, do you have to sign in, Adam, when you get there, typically? Yes, if they're Arizona Post trainings. So... Uh, for lack of better words, Arizona, like a certified training. Okay, so that this is what they do to make sure that you actually attended the training. That you, the, you will get the post hours credited for those hours. Okay, so you're required as part of your job duties to do a certain number of recurrent trainings, is that right? You're, yes. Okay, how many hours a year of recurrent training do you need? I couldn't tell you. How many of these post classes, and you can just give me an estimate, how many of these post classes is each year do you typically attend? It can vary because uh, some are officers have requested to attend and some are mandated that you attend to get your necessary post hours. Okay. Are there any trainings in that package that we've marked as exhibit number 80 as to which you recall that you requested to attend those specific trainings? This first one, the Integrity Centered Leadership. Uh, FTO Basic, Field Training Officer Basic.
That's all. Okay. If we look at the second second page of Exhibit 80, it, correct me if I'm wrong here, but the training, was it on temporary detention? That's correct. What is that? What was that training all about? If I recall correctly, this training was uh, specifically about the detention of uh, like prisoners in our temporary jail setting, our temporary jail facility that we have in Buckeye. Okay, so it had nothing to do with the temporary detention of children? No. Okay. Have you ever had any post-training or any other kind of training relative to the temporary detention of children? Specific training? No. Okay. Not that I can recall. Do you have any understanding based on either training or experience regarding the circumstances under which it is appropriate for you to detain a, chi uh, a child from the custody of its parent? <clears throat> Did we ask about formal training? Is that training, or, or experience, just, field training? Uh, yeah, a, a kind of a general knowledge base. I don't know that it was specific training, um, probably mostly through policy or pr procedure practice of uh, and, and detaining children in, a, in an exigent circumstance like we discussed. Okay. Am, I, am I correct that in order to detain, based, again, just on your training knowledge and experience, in order to detain a child from the custody of its parents without first getting a court order authorizing the detention or a warrant authorizing the detention, there has to be an um, exigent circumstance. Objection to form of foundation. I can speak about a line level patrol officer. Sure. What they would do. Sure, absolutely. I don't know what happens after that. Sure. But as a, a patrol officer, it's been my experience that a patrol officer will only detain in an exigent circumstance. And just so that we're on the same page in terms of understanding, when you say that a patrol officer will only detain in an exigent circumstance, that's one of those circumstances where if the child isn't detained right now, there's a high risk that child will suffer severe bodily injury or death. That's correct. Do you recall whether you, you learned that through your review of policy? I believe so. I believe that's pretty standard procedure yeah. in the departments that I've worked for. And all of the departments across the board. That's correct. That goes all the way back to Wyoming. Yes. And that's a stand. I think he said standard procedure, meaning that you you can't detain a child from its parents' custody unless there is a high risk that the child will be will suffer severe bodily injury or death within the time it takes to get a warrant. I'll say that uh, I don't know about can't. I don't know the specifics of that. But I'll tell you, as a as procedurally, as a patrol officer, uh, that is when I would detain a child in in an exigent circumstance. Otherwise, I would include other other people. Yeah, you might call a supervisor. You might call a social worker. You might involve other people if it's a non-emergency circumstance. That's correct. Okay, and then you would let them basically make the decision what to do, whether it's get a warrant or detain the child, whatever that may be. That's correct. What position do you hold currently with the city of Buckeye? I am a police sergeant. Which, do you have units or divisions? Or? I have a squad. Squad, what squad? Squad one. Squad one. What are your main job duties as a police sergeant? Um, I serve as a supervisor to those seven people and also a small squad of school resource officers. Um, I review their work, review the day-to-day -day operations of that squad. <clears throat> now, you mentioned in there in your training that you had a, a course, I think it was field officer training, or free, field training officer basic? That's correct. What is that course? I... 
It's a course that will certify you as a field training officer so that you can train new officers when they come onto the department. Is there a test or something that comes after this course? I don't recall whether there was a test or not. At the but, end of but you did take, take the course? I did complete the course, okay. yes. And did you become a field training officer? I did. Are you currently one? I am. In fact, as part of your job duties in supervising the seven subordinate officers and the school resource officers, um, part of those job responsibilities is field training of those officers, correct? It can be. Okay. Have you ever had discussions with your subordinates relative to the circumstances under which it is permissible to detain a child from the custody of its parents? No, I haven't. Okay. Have you yourself ever been in a situation where you made the decision to detain a child from the custody of its parents? No, I have not. Have you ever been present on the scene where perhaps one of your supervisors made that decision and detained a child from the custody of its parents? No, I haven't. Okay, okay this is the eighth page in, in Exhibit 80, and it's a program compliance confirmation for a course titled Search and Seizure Refresher? Yes? Yes. When did you complete that training? Looks like August 6th of 2015. Do you recall whether or not there were, well, how did they present that training, if you remember? Was it lecture format? Was there a PowerPoint? Were there handouts? There may have been a PowerPoint. Did you uh, make an attempt to locate that PowerPoint um, before coming here today to give your testimony? I did not. Mr. Crown, would you mind um, at some point, obviously not today, but uh, at some point make an effort to get us a copy of that PowerPoint? On the PowerPoint from this particular training? Yeah. If it's available, uh, okay. we can get that to you. Cool. I appreciate it. And this particular training, your, what was that called again? Search and seizure refresher? Yes. What was the general subject matter of you're, that to the extent you recall it? The one that you just said in June 2015? I think it was August. Right? It was August, August 6th. August 2015? Yeah. Okay. And I'll note, the training was put on by uh, Edwards and Ginn Law Firm, not by our specific department. So that PowerPoint would have to be. So you may be able to locate it, or somebody may be able to locate it from them? Possibly. Uh, we'll, we'll check into it. OK. Do you have a general recollection what that training covered? I mean, obviously, besides just the title, I, I can read that. Generally, yes. OK. And, and what um, subject areas? within the greater rubric of search and seizure where there's some specific areas that the focus was on? Uh, I think probably, as in a lot of search and seizure, is uh, warrantless type searches in regards to mostly to property. That's usually a hot topic. Okay, let me make sure I understand it. When you say warrantless searches, um, are you talking about the Fourth Amendment? Yes. Okay, and, that, and that's the one where we can't search or seize a person um, without due process of law unless there's some exception. That's correct. Objection to form inclination. Just based on your understanding and training, did I state that correctly? That's correct. Okay. And when we're talking about the seizure of a person, one of the exceptions would be that exigency exception we were talking about earlier. That's correct. Okay. In this search and seizure refresher course was, if, and you may not remember, it may, or you may remember specifically that they didn't cover it, did they talk at all about the circumstances under which it's appropriate to seize a child from its parents without first getting a warrant. I don't recall that being discussed. Okay. 
is one of the reasons, and, and you may not know this, but you may know it as a field training officer or supervisor, is one of the reasons that that's not necessarily covered in training is it because, generally speaking, your officers don't run into the situation where they're detaining children from the custody of their parents? I can, I can say it's not a common mm -hmm. occurrence with patrol officers to run into those types of situations. Before you became a uh, sergeant and a field training officer, were you a patrol officer? Did you work patrol? I was. Okay. For how long? I've been a sergeant for about a month, so okay. up until that time. Well, congratulations. Thank you. Tell me what the process is. If a patrol officer goes out on a call, let's just assume there's an allegation of child abuse. You're called out on a call. You look around and, yeah, this kid looks beat up. What is the process that you would go through procedurally to decide whether or not that child should be detained right now, immediately, or we should go get a warrant? Objection to form the foundation. Procedurally, if you witness those things you just talked about, you would keep them in your sight on scene initially. Mm -hmm. You would notify a supervisor and also notify whatever form of child protective services it was. So you wouldn't even necessarily as the patrol officer, you know, the first person on the scene, you wouldn't necessarily do anything other than stay there, make sure that nothing further is happening to the child while you make a call to your supervisor or potentially CPS or somebody else to come out and do further investigation. That's correct, not necessarily. Okay. Yes. But if, if you get to a circumstance where you, know, you, you come up and say the parent is in the process of beating the child with a big stick, would that be a, an exigent circumstance that would permit you there and then to grab that child and get them out of danger? Yes, that would seem to be a circumstance for sure. Okay, you don't need to stop and call your supervisor and talk to CPS or do any of this other stuff. You can just step right in because it's an exigency and grab that child. That's correct. Okay. And when we're, when we're talking about exigent circumstances and imminent danger, is that the sort of circumstance we're talking about where you know, the ax is falling and if you don't move right away, that child's gonna suffer severe injury? No really broad. That and, and possibly maybe a medical condition okay. that the child is in need of immediately. Okay, like their arm is broken and they're bleeding out or something and you, you've gotta deal with it, that sort of thing. Yes. Objection to form information. Did you um, search for any of your training documents uh, relative to the questions that we posed here in Exhibit A? Um, I, yes, I attempted to locate all the training documents that I had. Oh, okay. And that those attempts were successful or unsuccessful? Well, I, I've provided all of, the, all of the training documents that I have, okay, or, is that or at least my representation has. Okay. Are we talking about more than just the two documents that we've marked here, Exhibit 80 and 81? Were there more documents that you found? No, I don't have any reason to believe that there do you recall finding any of the PowerPoint um, presentations that related to the trainings that you've taken? No, I don't recall that. Okay. But you didn't call uh, Edwards and, was it Jen or Gen? I think it's pronounced Gen. Gen. You didn't call Edwards and Gen and ask them if they could provide you the PowerPoint? No, and again, I'm, I'm not positive that they had a PowerPoint. I know that he has a lecture program, but I, I don't know that it was by PowerPoint or... I got you. So you don't specifically remember a PowerPoint or not necessarily. a handout or whatever no, it was? I don't know. Okay. So when you signed on with the city of Buckeye or the town of Buckeye, 
Do you recall taking a loyalty oath? Yes. Okay. Do you recall generally, and again, I, I don't expect it to be verbatim, but do you recall generally the substance of that oath? Very generally, yes. Can you give me your general recollection? Again, not specific verbatim, I, I get it, but just generally what it was that you're promising to do? I hate to do it an injustice, so without looking at it, I don't, <laughs> that, that's fair. I don't know that I want to answer that. <laughs> that's fair. We'll mark his Exhibit 49. The... You going to stay in the 80s? No, 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 no. Okay. 80 and 81 is oh, just the two okay. training documents okay. they brought. Sorry. These are pre-marked. Okay, first of all, on uh, page number 247 of Exhibit 49, is that your signature there on the page? Toward the bottom? Yes. Okay. And do you recognize this document? Yes. What is this document? It is a loyalty oath for the state of Arizona, town of Buckeye. And is, is this a, a oath that you voluntarily took uh, when you were hired on at Buckeye? Yes. Okay. And this is an oath that, as a law enforcement officer, you, you take seriously? Yes. And here it says um, that you, Matthew Miller, do solemnly swear or affirm that you will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution and laws of the state of Arizona, that you will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, defend them against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and that you will faithfully and impartially discharge the duties of the office of police officer to the best of your ability. So help you God. Yes? Yes. And you try to do that every day in your job. That's correct. And in order to do that, is it important to you that you receive the training that's necessary to give you an understanding about the constitutional rules under the United States Constitution so that you understand the restrictions that are placed on you in your dealings with citizens? Are you asking if it's important? Yeah, so, important to you. Yes. Why, why is that? Why is it important to you? Objection to foreign foundation. Well, if I, if I swear to support the Constitution, then I would like to know what it is I'm supporting. That makes sense. Do you have any knowledge or understanding whether other government employees in the state of Arizona, for example, um, CPS employees, are required to take this same oath? Objection. Calls for speculation. Yeah, if you don't know. I if, don't know. Okay, nobody's ever talked to you about that? No. Do you have any friends that are CPS workers? I do not. Okay. So as you sit here today, you, you have no basis to know whether or not CPS employees have to take this same oath to support and defend the Constitution? I don't know. Do you know whether or not um, CPS employees, Arizona State CPS employees, get any training at all relative to the constitutional rights that limit their ability to interfere with families? Calls for speculation. And if you don't know, just tell us that. I don't know what training they get. But at least insofar as you're concerned, it's important to you in order to do your job properly that you be trained on the constitutional limitations on your authority, correct? It is important to me, yes. Because you want to do the best job that you possibly can for your um, constituents, correct? Correct. And if you're not trained about what the law is, it makes it very difficult for you to do that job to the best of your ability, right? That's correct. Because when you're out in the field, you have to make decisions, important decisions, oftentimes immediately and on your own, right? That's correct. So you need to know what the rules are that govern those decisions. That's correct. And that's important to you. Yes. I'm gonna show you what we'll mark as exhibit number 50 to your deposition. 
Now this was sort of interesting to me because I didn't understand why there were two different documents, and that's, I'm going to ask you to sort of explain that, but what is this document here that's marked as exhibit number 50? It's a oath of office. It's similar to the one we just looked at. Actually, if we look at the, uh, after the numbered paragraphs in exhibit number 49, there's a paragraph that starts, State of Arizona, County of Maricopa. And then it carries on, I, Matthew Miller. You see that? Yes. When I was looking at Exhibit 49, comparing it to Exhibit 50, it looks to me like it is a verbatim statement of the oath that you signed on Exhibit 49. Am I correct? It looks to me like the wording is slightly different, but... The concept. The so concept, yes. Why is it that you have two different oaths of office? This looks like a photocopy of a, uh, like a, one that you could put in your office. So they, they give you a copy of the oath of office and kind of put it in a little, like a platform that you can oh. put in your office. So it's sort of like a uh, embossed certificate in a frame. Yes. Do you have any understanding why it is they, they give you the oath of office and an embossed certificate in a displayable frame? I, I believe it's a document that you know officers hold in high regard. It's an important document. Yes. Not, not just an official document, but it's important to you. Yes, it is. Do you know... Um, do you recall whether or not you have your copy hanging somewhere? Uh, I believe my copy is at my house. Hanging on a wall? No, it's not. No. Bookshelf? Yeah. But you did keep it? I did keep it, yes. For the same reasons, because this is an important oath to you. It's important to you that when you're out in the field, you recognize that you're policing a free people and that the government does have restrictions on its power. That's correct. Mm -hmm. And you keep that in the back of your mind and everything you do every day when you're out doing your job. That's correct. And that's important to you. Objection, form and foundation. It is. Okay, I'm gonna show you what we will mark as exhibit number 51 your deposition. Do you recognize this document, exhibit number 51? Yes, I do. What is it? It is the former uh, entry to a field manu manual, so like a, a policy and procedure. What, what do you mean when you say former? It has a, a March of 2008 date on it, so we have since have, we have different documents now. So the procedure may have been revised it's, since this was... Yeah, okay. yes. Do you know when this particular procedure was revised? And you can give me a rough estimate. I couldn't say for sure. Do you know whether or not this particular procedure was in full force and effect on May 10th, 2013? Uh, to my understanding, it was, yes. Okay. <clears throat> so if we're talking today or going to be talking today about the events and circumstances, things that happened on May 10th, 2013, it's this particular procedure that would have applied. I believe that's correct. Okay. And this is titled, at least the subject, is Juveniles, Medical Treatment and Abuse. What's your understanding of the purpose of this, um, did you call it a procedure manual or... Yeah, they're titled many different things, but uh, some sort of policy or procedure or field manual. Okay, what's your understanding of the purpose of this particular uh, policy or procedure? <clears throat> I think it's similar to any policy that's entered, just to establish a kind of a standard operating procedure for whatever the, the title may be, for whatever occurrence is happening. You can turn to page and down in the lower right-hand corner, there's some uh, Bates numbers. 
is 00036. And you see in the left-hand column, there's uh, bold uh, words there. It says, abused children. Yes. Okay. What is the purpose of this particular policy? Or let, let me ask that differently. Um, if you have an understanding, can you explain to me when you would apply this particular policy out in the field? When you would come across abused children. Okay, or suspected abuse. Yes. It doesn't necessarily have to be that you can see the abuse happening right there and then. It's just there's a report you're coming out to investigate. That's correct. Okay. And then it says right here that uh, an investigation and written report shall be made if you are out there investigating a uh, instance of suspected child abuse. That's correct. Do you recall, did, did you conduct any investigation uh, for child abuse when you went out to the Pellerin home on May 10th, 2013? Did I conduct an investigation? Yeah. No. Okay. What did you do there? What was your purpose? I was called there uh, by CPS. The notes that I had in my call comments is what they would be called. It's what you can view on the computer as you're responding to a call. Uh, were that a CPS worker needed a camera and was already on scene on an alleged child abuse. So she called you for a camera? That was, my, that was all the information that I had responding to that call. Do you have any understanding why they don't just carry their own $10 camera? Yeah, cause for speculation. I don't know. Okay. It just, it's just odd. Um, or a cell phone with a camera. Okay, you went, you went out to the scene in response to this call, right? That's correct. You brought a camera with you. I did. Was it a cell phone camera or a... It was a digital separate camera. digital camera. Had you been called out on that sort of call before where a social worker wants you to come out and take pictures? I don't recall it another time. Okay. Did that seem odd to you? Objection to Foreman Foundation. I don't think it seemed odd. But. Okay, so, so tell me how things unfolded. You got this call. Did it, did it come in like a text message over your computer, or did you actually get a radio call, or how did that work? It will first <laughs> appear on your computer. Mm -hmm. uh, we refer to them as an MDC, Mobile Data Computer. Um, all of our patrol vehicles have them. Uh, you, as an officer, are assigned to a beat, a specific area, and that call will pop up on your computer first. And if you're paying attention, you can view the call first, but they will also dispatch you over the radio to that call. Okay. So let's start from the point you got the dispatch. Uh, maybe you recall seeing it come up on your screen, maybe you don't. It Probably not really important at this point, but you got the dispatch and you headed out there to the Pellerin home, yes? That's correct. I received an address to go to, yes. Okay. And if you could sort of, and I know this may be difficult, it was uh, quite a while ago, but if you can sort of draw in your mind a, a mental picture of what you saw as you arrived at the home, can you describe that for us? Uh, there were several subjects standing in the driveway. Um, that's about all I remember driving up, is just uh, some people standing in the driveway, and then I was approached by a CPS worker immediately. Was the CPS worker that approached you, did she come from that group of people in the driveway? I believe so. Do you have a recollection of who it was, or at least some of the, the, I think you called them subject, some of the subjects that were standing together in the driveway? Do I recall now who they were? Is that what you're asking me? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, reviewing my report, I, I could say, but I, I don't recall right this second. Okay. Did you bring your report here with you today? Yes, it's here somewhere. Okay. 
if we can uh, take a moment off the uh, record, get a copy of the report, review it, refresh your recollection, and probably for the balance of the morning, that's what we're going to be talking about is what happened there at the home, um, what you did, what you heard people say or do, what you saw, that sort of thing. So it may be beneficial at this point to take a little break and review the report. Okay. We went off the record and you were able to take a few moments to review a um, transcription and your police report and some other documents. Was that effort helpful in uh, refreshing your recollection of the events of May 10th, 2013? Yes. Okay. Before we get into that, there's a couple little cleanup things I want to do. One is to take a look at exhibit number 81 and just give me a brief description of what that is. I don't know what this first page is. I haven't seen anything printed out like that. I mean, it, it's labeled annual training record, so I assume that's what it is um, for 2014. Thank you. And then uh, it's kind of more of what we've seen in the other exhibit with AZ Post training that I've completed. The certificates of completion that you sign? That's correct. Okay. And if you can just sort of flip through them to make sure that those are all essentially the same sort of stuff we're talking about. Halfway through, it switches to 2013. And then 2012. Okay, so basically, is it correct that what we have here in exhibits 80 and 81 is your certificates of completion for 2012 through 2000, did you say 14 or 15 on the first one? I would 14, I think is what it says. Through 2014, at least with respect to 80, Exhibit 81, right? Yes, and this is AZ Post training, so hours that you get credited for through AZ Post. Okay, okay. And then I'm going to show you what we'll mark as Exhibit number 83. We had a little bit of a conversation off the record on this regarding this document. Um, and if you can just tell us, if you have any understanding, what is reflected, what data is reflected here on this document. I don't know what this is. Okay. Yeah, that comports with our discussion off the record. We, nobody's very sure. I'm going to show you what we'll mark as exhibit number 83 for your deposition. And uh, I'll have the same sorts of questions. I'm not sure what this is either. Okay. If you turn to the second page of Exhibit 83, there's a little spreadsheet there in the far right-hand column. It's titled Credit Hours. You see that? Yes. Do you have an understanding of what we're talking about here when we're talking about credit hours? Not specifically. I don't know exactly what hours they are talking about specifically. Do you recall taking a training titled Accreditation Familiarization? No. How about Law and Legal Updates? Yes. Okay. If you look at uh, page one, far right-hand column, there's some names that appear to be names of courses that you might have taken listed in that column. Do you see those? Yes. And you recognize Law and Legal Updates, right? Yes. You recognize Skills Enhancement Shooting, 2015? Yes. How about Field Training Officer Basic? Yes. Biased Policing and Racial Profiling? Yes. Search and Seizure? Yes. Skills Enhancement Shooting Rifle, 2015? Yes. Temporary Detention? Yes. Integrity Centered Leadership? Yes. Now, we talked a little bit about Exhibits 80 and 81 and some of the certificates of completion that you had in there. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I saw certificates of completion for some classes bearing the same names and titles that we've just listed here um, on Exhibit 83. That's correct. Okay. And you told me earlier that when you take these classes, part of the, the process is that you get credit for the hours in class. The Arizona Post classes? Yes. Yes. Do you have any understanding as to whether or not those credit hours are 
have kept track of somewhere? I know that the Arizona Post hours are, yes. Okay. If you look at page two of exhibit 83, and you look over at that right-hand column that says credit hours, do you recall at all how many credit hours you got for the law and legal updates training? No, I don't know. Okay, if you look at the right-hand column that says you got two hours or reflects two credit hours, does that refresh your recollection as to how many credit hours you obtained by attending that class? On which page do you see that? Okay, if you look at, um, if you look here, oops, at the third row of the spreadsheet, and then correspond that, law and legal updates, to the oh. third row on the second page. And then it tells us how many credit hours, I think it tells us how many credit hours. I'm just trying to establish whether or not that fits with your recollection. It's certainly possible. I was just, I didn't know that these two were side by side. Oh, okay. I understand. I was going to ask you just to assume for the moment. Confused. I get it. Sometimes in Excel, when you, if you don't print it in what portrait or land, one of the two portrait or landscape, it'll print two pages instead of okay. sideways. But I'm assuming, and I'm going to ask you to assume, and if I'm wrong, somebody I'm sure will correct me, but I'm um, asking you to assume that these go together like this, okay. side by side. And it, it looks like in 2015, you took quite a few uh, classes. Do you re recall taking quite a few classes last year? I don't, I don't know if I recall how many I took. Well, there's 13 reflected here. There's 13 entries. And I think you told me that integrity centered leadership, that was like a two or three day course? Yes, two day I believe. Okay. And then if we look at the corresponding uh, credit hour entry for integrity centered leadership, it tells us it was 14 credit hours. Yes. Does that comport with your recollection? Of yes. It does. If you look down at this bold number total, 68.8, does that comport with your recollection of how many credit hours of training you took last year, 2015? It is possible. It doesn't say exactly what that number is for, but mm -hmm. it's possible that that's the total number of hours. Okay. But as you're sitting here today, you can't specifically say, oh yeah, I had 68.8 hours. No, I can't. But you can say, you give me an estimate, because you, I mean, you were in these classes. You can say, can't you, that you know, plus or minus 10 hours, that's within the range of what you took last year. It could certainly be. It seems to me, and you'll correct me if I'm wrong, that at least in 2015, it's quite a bit of training. That's, that's almost two full work weeks of training. Yes. Okay. And one of the reasons that you get that sort of intensive training is because you have a very important relationship with your constituents in performing your job duties, right? Objection of form and foundation. Yes. And the agency you work for, um, is it city or town of Buckeye or is it the? City now. City, city of Buckeye. The city of Buckeye wants to make sure that you have the educational resources that you need in order to do your job effectively. Is that your understanding? Yes, that's accurate. Now, before that little interlude, we were getting ready to talk about the events of May 10th, 2013. And I think uh, you'd already told us you, you received the call, you drove up to the home, and you saw some, some people, some subjects standing around in the driveway. That's correct. One of them walked up to you to speak with you, and that turned out to be the social worker. That's correct. And as you were reviewing one of the transcripts on the break, you had mentioned that um, there was also a military person 
there? Uh, I found out shortly thereafter that I, th I believe there was more than one military person there. Okay, describe the scene for me. You, you, you pull up, you pull up to the the house. You get out of your car. What happens next? Uh, I was approached by the CPS worker. Okay, the CPS worker approaches you. Mm -hmm. Then what? Um, she gave me just a, a brief kind of a description of what was going on. What, okay. Why I was there, I guess. And as you're, you're sort of focus on this picture in your mind and she's approaching you, she's, she's talking to you. Try to remember the, the words she said and the way she said it, if you could, and describe for me what you see in that middle picture. You, you want to know what she said? Yeah. Is that what you're asking me? Yeah, and I, I know you may not get it verbatim, but just the gist of what she was telling you. She told me that uh, she was there to do a welfare check on some these children. That uh, the military, whatever military there was in Japan, had called over here and requested a welfare check on the children because there was some kind of incident in Japan regarding the children and their parents and so that she was there to do, to check on them for the military, was my understanding. Okay, let me make sure that I've pretty much got it right here. She, she walks up to you to explain to you why she called, right? Yes. And she tells you that somebody with the military in Japan called and requested a welfare check because some incident had happened in Japan. That's correct. Do you recall her saying that it was, was um, or what that incident in Japan was? Uh, she described a little bit of it to me. Um, just reported to me some, some injuries, that, that the children had sustained injuries in Japan. Um, she didn't get into too much detail on what, what those were. Um, and that because of that case, they would they wanted to check on the children over here. So at, at that point, after that conversation with the social worker, was it your understanding that all she was there for at that point was to do a welfare check, make sure the kids were okay? That was my understanding. Okay. She didn't tell you at that point, hey, I'm out here, I've looked at these kids, I think they're abused, we're gonna take them out of this home. Overly broad, assumes facts, or words to that effect. Uh, there was no talk about removal okay. to me, no. Okay, what, uh, we've had this conversation now, and she's told you what, why she wants you there, what she's supposed to do. What happens next? Um, she she kind of gives me the, uh, tells me the people that are that are on scene. Um, I, I believe she gave me the names of the military people there, and then uh, the Pellerin family. She gave me the names of those involved, and uh, also uh, the grandfather of the children was also there, and a friend of his, from what I understood. Um, just as a general uh, police show up on scene thing. I, I gathered their name information just so I would have that for a report later. And then uh, took that back to my computer in my car to document that information into the computer. And um, Officer Chestnut eventually arrived on scene. I, I don't know the times of how long that was before he arrived. At one point, uh, uh, we went inside the house, 
Um, and I believe Mrs. Pellerin was in there and the two children from what I remember. And CPS worker mentioned to me about some possible bruising on, a, on an arm of one of the kids and asked that I document injury or lack of injury on the children with, with uh, photos. So we went inside the house and uh, documented through photos, injury, lack of injury. And that, that was pretty much the conclusion of my involvement. Let me just go through this. Um, the social worker identified for you the people that were out in the driveway? That's correct. Did she actually introduce you to them, say, this is Mr. So-and-so, he's with the military, this is, you know, Mr. Pellerin, this is the grandfather? Did, he actu did she actually introduce you? No, I don't think so. Okay. How did you go about gathering up um, the various subject information? Well, she, she just told me who the people were. Okay. And I don't recall whether I had a conversation with any of those people to... I believe I had a conversation with the grandfather, uh, just obtaining a little bit more information about him, maybe a phone number or something, I recall. Did you have a conversation with the grandfather about any of the substance of why it was this was all going on that night, May 10th? No. Okay. Was the grandfather cooperative with you? Yes. At any point in time, out in the driveway, not in the home yet, but out in the driveway, did you speak with either of the military personnel? It, it seems like maybe I did, but not about anything specific with a, with a case or anything like that. Maybe an introduction, or hello, or, or something, I, I don't recall, but it seems like maybe I spoke to one of them briefly. And just so I'm clear, how many were there from the military? I could review my report. Sure, absolutely. You. Whatever you need to do to refresh your recollection okay. for any of my questions, please do whatever you need to do. Uh, it appears there were two from the military. Do you have their names there? Uh, Chief Master Sergeant Scott Leach with the Air Force and Air Force Investigator Sergeant Johnson. Johnson, you said? Yes, sir. Thank you. <clears throat> now, out there in the driveway, you didn't have any specific conversation with either of the military personnel. Just basically said, hi and some pleasantries maybe. Yes, that I recall that, that was all. At any other point while you were there that evening, did you have any conversations with the military personnel? No, I didn't. Okay. Did you, out in the driveway now, did you have any interaction with either Mr. or Mrs. Pellerin? No, not that I recall. I don't recall speaking with them out there. Okay, so when you drove up, the social worker came out, spoke to you, gave you a little rundown what's happening, who the players are. You went over, introduced yourself to the military people, spoke with the grandfather. I only spoke with him to gather, uh, I believe, maybe a, a date of birth okay. and a telephone number or something. Okay, so, so after introducing yourself to the military, you gathered some... Uh, personal information from the grandfather, like where he lives, his phone number, that sort of thing? Yes. Then you went back to your car and typed all that into the computer? That's correct. Okay, what happened next? <laughs> You're in your car, you just finished up putting all the data that you need to put into your machine. You get out. What do you do? From what I recall, um, the next step was we, we went into the home. Okay, so uh, in that first conversation with the social worker, she didn't tell you yet then, when she first came up and talked about the events in Japan, those sorts of things, she didn't tell you then, oh, come on in here, I need you to take some pictures of something that I think might be bruising. Did she? I don't recall whether it was then or uh, after I exited my patrol car. I'm not, okay. I'm not sure. She, she escorted me into the home, so I, at some point then, she told me that she thought she saw some, some bruising on an arm. Okay, so I guess what I'm looking for is, is 
did all this information come to you in, in one conversation or two? Correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like two conversations. The first one is when she came up and introduced herself, gave you some general information. You did some work on your computer after talking to the military and those guys. And then you had another conversation with her as you were walking into the house. That's certainly possible, yes. Okay. Does that comport with your recollection? It seems to. I mean, okay. I obviously had more than one conversation with sure. with her. So, do you, do you recall at all as you were walking into the home with her, the general sub substance of that conversation? Uh, the only only thing I recall is, so I gathered my camera, and she asked that I document with some photos. Um, she, she told me that there was uh, some marks on, on the arm that she thought may be consistent with a grab mark or, or somebody grabbing an arm. Did you, at some point, on which child do you recall? Uh, I believe it was the little boy. I don't recall his name offhand. I could get it from my report. Sound familiar? Yes. About how old was that little boy, if you recall? Um, just well, let, let me ask you this. Math. Yeah, let me ask you this first. Um, without referencing your report, do you have sort of a mental picture of the little boy in your mind? Yes. And then just roughly, what do you see there in terms of age? What do you can estimate? Uh, I'd estimate probably four or five, maybe. Okay. In that area. What was his demeanor when you first met him? I didn't spend a lot of time with him. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't have a lot of conversation with him. So I, I quiet, cooperative. He was cooperative? Yes. Were his parents cooperative with this concept of you going in and taking pictures of him? Uh, yes, as far as I understood, everything was consensual. When you walked in the home, you came in the front door or some other entry? I believe it was the front door. Okay. When, you, when you walked in the home, did you look around at sort of the circumstances of the home, get a general feel for, you know, the lay of the land? I spent most of the time there near the entry. I didn't, um, in my mind, I wasn't really there to do a lot of investigating, so I... I didn't encompass everything. Sure. So you, you didn't do, for example, a sweep of the home? No. Okay. You, you know what a protective sweep is, right? That's correct. Okay. What, what is that? Uh, it's where officers will uh, briefly go through the home to make sure that there's either no subjects inside or, or no, uh, nobody being harmed or, or something like that. Is it standard procedure when you um, are called out to someone's home for you to do a protective sweep before you go in and start doing your work? Standard? Yeah. No. Okay. Under what circumstances would the patrol officer normally do a protective sweep of a home before um, going to do their work? Objection of foreman foundation. <clears throat> maybe uh, some sort of uh, suggestion that maybe there's more people in the home, mm -hmm. or uh, you know, the potential for a hazard or somebody to uh, harm those on scene while officers are there. Um, some set of articulable facts that would lead you to believe that we need to make sure this home doesn't have anybody that's going to harm us or that anybody in need of care. Okay, so, so basically what, what you're doing um, when you're doing a protective sweep is making sure that there, there's no danger to the, the people that are coming on scene. And there's nobody hiding there. There's not like a dangerous criminal or something there. That's generally what you're looking for when you're doing a protective sweep, right? That's correct. Okay. And you, you mentioned something that uh, is interesting to me. 
you said, and correct me if I got this wrong, but that you, you need to have some articulable facts. What were you talking about there? Something specific that you could reference in a report possibly later to justify going through and, and uh, doing a protective sweep through the home. Okay, because normally, correct me if I'm wrong, but normally the Constitution prohibits you as a police officer from going into somebody's home without their permission unless there are specific <coughs> articulable facts to justify the warrantless search of the home, right? Objection to form and foundation. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Do you know whether or not those same rules apply to all government agents, including CPS investigators? False for speculation. If, if, if you don't know, you can just say you don't know. Objection of form and foundation. Are. You don't know what I don't they're. know what their rules are, no. Well, do you have any understanding whether or not the Constitution applies to them? Objection of form and foundation. I don't know. <laughs> but you do know it applies to you. Yes. Objection and, of form and foundation. And that's why you pretty much confined your activities to the entryway of the home. Well, I said earlier mm -hmm. about uh, the feeling of it being a consensual contact. Mm -hmm. um, but I didn't have any reason to go through the home at that time. Okay, so even, even though you felt you had consent, you didn't feel it was necessary to intrude into this family's private life further than you already were. That's correct. Now the social worker, she, she walked with you into the home, right? To my recollection, yes. Did she also confine herself to that general entry area? I don't recall if she did or not. I know she was there at one point. I, I don't know if that's the only place she was. Did she stay with you when you were taking the pictures of the children? She was in close proximity, yes, okay. I believe so. Where did the pictures of the children, where did that take place, the photographing of the children? I believe there was a, a restroom right off of the entryway there. To the right or to the left, do you remember? I believe to the right as you walked in. Okay. So you went in the, did you go immediately from that entry area to the restroom? I don't know if there was some uh, conversation right there in that in that entry area, and into the. I believe it opened up into like a maybe a dining area or a living room or something there. But there was probably some conversation right there. Okay, who participated in that conversation? Uh, I believe both officer myself and Officer Chestnut were there. Uh, I believe the CPS worker was there. I believe Mrs. Pellerin was there. And the two children, that's, that's all I remember being there. And this is just out in that sort of larger entry area? Yes. And you said that it sort of adjoined a dining room and a living room? From what I remember, it, it, it opened up into some different rooms, kind of an open area and maybe a kitchen. Okay, so, so we walk in the front door off to the left, is that sort of where the open living room area would have been? It's possible. Okay, and then do you recall the dining area being sort of front, maybe off a little to the left, if you're looking straight ahead? Yes, I believe so. And the bathroom was over here to the right? Yes, and from what I remember, it was almost immediate okay. to the right. And by this time, by the time you're having this conversation indoors, Officer Chestnut had already arrived? Yes. Okay. Did Officer Chestnut stay there with you in that general entry area, or did he sort of wander around the house? Uh, it seemed to me that he stayed there in that general area. Okay. And that was for the whole time you were there? I believe so, yes. Okay. How about um, the social worker? Do you, do you recall what she well who started the conversation here before we get too far along was it the social worker that started talking talking to to you and officer chestnut the pellerins you said there's this 
sort of congregation of all of you here in this entry area and that there was a conversation. Well, overly broad, so you're talking about the conversation in that area only, or? That's what I thought. I thought all right, I just want to make sure. No, we can, tr we can try again. I thought it was fairly clear. We'll just start over. You're in that entry area. You, Officer Chestnut, the social worker, Angie Pellerin, and the two kids are in that same entry area with you. Mm. Yes? Yes. There's a conversation. Yes? Yes. Okay. Who starts that conversation, if you recall? I don't recall specific conversations. Mm -hmm. um, I recall meeting the children at that time and kind of just, um, if I recall putting them at ease, just saying hello kind of thing. Um, it seems that there was conversation between the CPS worker and Mrs. Pellerin. Mm -hmm. I don't know what that conversation, what was what the was body that? of that conversation. You don't have even a general recollection of the substance of that conversation? I don't. I don't, I don't know that I was trying to overhear what they were talking about. Okay, they were just there in front of you talking, so you remember they were talking, but you were not necessarily paying attention to what they were talking about. Right. I was mostly just uh, kind of introducing myself to the children, as I remember. Okay, and you, you said you wanted to put them at ease. Yeah, yes. Okay. Were you able to do that, put them at ease? Uh, the children didn't seem to be too uncomfortable with this situation. Who was uncomfortable with the situation? Calls for speculation. Um, I don't know. Did anybody there in that entryway look like they might be uncomfortable with the situation? Assumes facts, calls for speculation. Well, let me back up a little bit. You remember being there, right? Yes. And you remember these people being there with you, right? Yes. You, you can sort of draw a mental image in your mind about who was there, right? Yes. So you would have seen them, yes? Briefly, and okay. yes. And, then and as, as part of your training and experience as a police officer, one of the things that you're always looking at when you're interacting with a subject is their demeanor, yes? Are they aggressive? Are they demure? What are they acting like? Yes. Okay. Did you do that here in this entryway when you're having these conversations? Uh, I viewed everybody there, okay. and then I immediately turned my attention to the, the children that I was there to document injury or lack of injury. Okay. Did the children uh, seem like happy kids? Take some form. I guess I don't know. I... Do you have children of your own? I do. How many? Uh, four. four. Based on your own experience with your four kids, did it seem to you that evening? Well, let me ask you this first, because back then in 2013, May, did you have four kids? I did. Okay. Younger than 10, any of them? Yes. Okay. Based on your experience with your own children back then, May 2013, when you're looking at these two children, trying to put them at ease, do they seem like just normal kids to you? Normal kids, yes. Yeah. Do they seem afraid? Not necessarily. Okay. How did they present? Overly broad. Um, quiet, that's about all I recall. Okay. Do you recall the general substance? Now, now Ms. Wagner, after she had this conversation with Ms. Pellerin, did she then turn to you and ask you to perform some task? No, I don't think so. Uh, I knew going in there that I was just there to document. Okay. What was your cue to go ahead and start taking pictures of the children? There's this conversation unfolding in front of you in the entryway. At some point, it transitioned into you taking the photos? Yes. Okay. It, describe that for me. How, how'd that happen? Uh, like I said, we, we walked in and uh, immediately turned my attention to the children because I was under the impression that we were all there for consent, through consent, and that the, uh, we were just going to document uh, the children's either injury or lack of injury. 
and the way you were going to document the injury or lack of injury <coughs> is take photographs. That's correct. Did you also document the injury or lack of injury in written form? Through a report, yes. And to do that report, at least at some point, you had to lay eyes on the kids and actually, you know, look at their arms, their legs, their chest, their back, their head, that sort of thing? Yes. Okay. Do you recall there being any serious injuries to any of the kids when you were looking at them? Overly broad seems facts. I don't recall serious injury. Okay. And if you had seen a serious injury, that's something that would appear in your report? Yes. Okay. The converse is also true, isn't it? That if you saw something but you didn't think it was that serious, that would also appear in your report. <coughs> I would try not to draw any conclusions of my own, but I would document that I, I didn't see injury or okay. something like that. So, for example, if there was a red mark on a child that looked to you like a bug bite, for example, that's what you would have written in your report? Yes. Okay. <coughs> and if... For example, the social workers said, hey, there's a bruise right here. If you looked and didn't see a bruise, would you have reflected in the report that you, know, you had a little disagreement as to whether or not there was a bruise? I don't know if I would reflect a disagreement. Um, if I didn't see something, I certainly wouldn't document that I had. Okay. And if you had seen something serious, you would have documented this is serious. Assume yes. facts overly broad. Yes. I'm sorry, one more time. Okay. Yes, I would, I would document that. Okay, so if we, as we're reading through your report, we don't see any uh, narrative talking about a serious injury, is it fair to presume that you, <coughs> saw, that you saw no serious injury? I did not observe serious injury, no. And you, you have a recollection as you're sitting here today that when you were looking at those children, you saw no serious injury. That's correct. Okay. Was the house clean? I, again, I, I said earlier, I wasn't uh, really there to investigate. I wasn't paying real close attention to everything that was going on around in the house. The part that you could see, you're in the entryway, you can see the living room, you can see the kitchen, you can see the bathroom, you can certainly see the entryway. Did, did those areas look clean and tidy? If you can I could recall. say clean, but I, I, could, I wouldn't say that uh, I would document uh, them being filthy or, or dirty. Okay, and if they had been filthy or dirty or unsanitary in some way, that would have appeared in your report? Yes. Okay. You have this conversation in the entryway, and we're going to transition into taking photographs of the children. You've already looked at them, so you have a general um, idea of what's there, right? Yes. What do you do next? Uh, I take the photographs. Did you take them there in the entryway? or? No, I believe it was in the, um, the bathroom. I believe the door was left open, but to gather a little more privacy, I, I think we entered the bathroom. Okay, and why did you think it was important to have a little bit of privacy? Again, I spoke about um, trying to keep the children at ease, and I just, I, I didn't want to, maybe for them to feel not at ease by being out in the open. Right, and, you, and based on your experience with your own kids, you know that, you know, a kid being asked to you know, show their body to strangers, that can be a little bit unsettling for the child? Yes, it could be. Yeah. And so what you wanted to do is give them a little bit of comfort, a little bit of privacy to try to keep them at ease so it was as um, non-traumatic for them as possible. That's correct. And that was important to you? It was important to me, yes. Why was it important to you? Because uh, children can be, you know, they, they uh, oftentimes need adults to watch over them and uh, become victims a lot of times. And I, I just always try to 
maybe it's because of my own kids, try to, in any situation that I go to, keep the children at ease the best that I can so that the circumstance isn't worse than what it needs to be. Because those sorts of circumstances that can be emotionally quite traumatic for a child, right? The sorts of circumstances that were unfolding that objection to form and foundation. Yes, they can be. Was there anybody in the bathroom with you while you were taking these uh, photos of the children? There was. Do you recall who? I do not. Okay. I'm going to show you a series of photos, and we'll mark this as exhibit number 37. It's a 14-page series of photos, and I've marked each page 37.1234 all, all the way through 14, just for everybody's reference. In looking at those photos, um, do you recognize those photos as being um, an accurate depictions of the pictures that you took that evening with the children? Yes. Okay. And do those photos represent accurate depictions of the condition of the children as you saw them or as you remember seeing them with your own visual inspection that evening? Yes. Okay. Looking there at the first photo, can you tell us what that is or what it depicts? Uh, it is a photo of the half of the back and shoulders of the little girl. Okay. Why, if you recall, why was it you were taking that particular picture? Again, I was just trying to document in a least intrusive way injury or lack of injury okay. on the children. And in looking at that particular picture, did you document injury or did you document the lack of injury? I did not observe any injury in that picture. Okay, we can go to the next picture. Well, let me ask you this first before you turn the page. Did the social worker indicate to you that she thought she saw an injury there in, on the girl's back? On the girl? Mm -hmm. Not that I remember. Okay. Let's go ahead and go to the next picture. And what is that a picture of? Legs. Do you recall whether that was the girl's legs or the boy's legs? I believe the girl. Okay. What was it you were attempting to document there in that picture? Just again, injury or lack of injury. And were, did you document with that photograph a, an injury or a lack of injury? I did not see any injury okay. in that photograph. Okay, next photograph please. And what's that one? Uh, it's the front of her legs. And again, I presume you were documenting an injury or lack of injury, right? Correct. Did you document in those photos an injury or a lack of injury? Lack of injury. Okay, next picture. Do you know what that is a photo of? Of uh, the little girl's arm. Right or left arm? Appears to right. Okay. Did you document with that photograph an injury or a lack of injury? Lack of injury. Okay, next photo. Is that her left arm? It is. Okay. And in that photograph, did you document an injury or a lack of injury? A lack of injury. Let, let's say visual injury. Okay, lack of visual injury. Yes. You can't tell with your visual inspection whether or not she has a broken bone or internal bleeding That's or correct. a failing organ, something like that, right? Yes. Okay, so what you're doing here is, is just a visual inspection of the skin and photographs, right? That's correct. Mostly you're just looking for bumps and bruises, that sort of thing. Yes. Okay. This next picture, what's the page number in the bottom right-hand corner on that? Uh, I believe it's 37.6. Okay, 37.6. What's that a picture of? Of the little girl. And it's a frontal picture. Yes. Okay. What were you documenting there? Uh, injury or lack of injury. And in that particular photograph, was it an injury that you were taking a picture of or the lack of an injury? I did not see any injuries okay. in that picture. Okay. And as you sit here today, do you, do you have a recollection in your mind of, of that little girl um, that evening in the bathroom as you're photographing her? Do you sort of have that Im image in your mind? Yes. 
and looking at that image in your mind as you sit here today, your memory, not just the photo, but your memory, is that she didn't have any injuries. I did not observe any visual injuries on her. Okay. The next uh, picture, please. Okay. What is that a picture of? And that's 37.7, correct? Yes. Okay. What's that a picture of? Of the little boy's forehead. Well, head. Head. And again, the purpose of that photograph was to document injuries or lack of injuries? That's correct. Okay. Do you recall the little boy having any injuries to his head? He had a bump on his forehead. Bump and a little red dot, right? Can I refer to my report? Sure, absolutely. Okay. Again, anytime you need to look at something to refresh your recollection, that's fine. Yeah, I just indicated a bump on his forehead. Okay, so you didn't see any little red mark? Not that I indicated. Okay. So the purpose of this picture was to document that bump. And also the rest of his... And the rest of his... Of his face and head. Well, I suppose lack of injury to the rest of his face and head. The bump was the only thing I observed. Okay. And you, before you took these pictures, you actually looked at the rest of his head to see if there was some injury. That's correct. Okay. And you saw none? I did not see any. Okay. Did you talk to the little boy at all about that bump? I don't recall whether I did or not. Okay. Do you recall uh, anybody um, saying that the dog had knocked him down? Does that ring a bell? I don't recall. Okay. Is that something that, to, if, if somebody had talked to you about it, is it something you would have put in your report? Possibly. Uh, but again, I was there not to investigate mm -hmm. necessarily. So... Um, I wasn't trying to speak really with anybody about the incident itself or okay. what was going on. Okay. So the, the, the total purpose of your being there was to get these pictures taken? Yes. Okay. All right, let's go to the next photo. Well, let me ask you, before we turn that page, you have your own kids. You had four kids at the time. Um, is it normal? Well, let me ask you this. Are your, are your children boys or girls? I have both. Both, okay. In your experience as a father, is it normal for little boys to, you know, fall down, bump around, come home with scraped knees, bruises, things like that? Assumes facts are really broad, relevant. Yes. And oftentimes they can't even tell you how they got them, right? That's correct. Yeah. Especially if they're active kids. Right. Yes. When you looked at this child with that little bump on his head, did that strike you as a serious injury? No. Next page, please. One last question before I talk to you about that page. If that, if that bump on the head had looked serious, like there's a big goose egg there or something, or blood, something that looked to you like it, it maybe should be seen by a doctor. You would have written that in your report, right? That's correct. And you, you might even, if it was serious enough, you might even uh, have stepped in to get the child to the doctor right away. I, th I believe that the appropriate people were there to get that done without me mm -hmm. doing that myself. But that, yes, he would have, I would have overseen him getting some medical care. Okay, but under the, under the procedures, the policy, and the rules that you've been trained on, it was within your power. If that child, if that bump was serious enough, you could take him on your own right there and then to the doctor to get him treated. That's correct. Okay. But nobody that evening was talking about going to the doctor, right? No. Okay. And you didn't think it would be necessary either because it didn't look serious? For that bump, no. Yeah. Okay. Right, two minutes. This, why don't we take a little break, because I think she needs to change a tape. Okay. Okay, turning our attention to exhibit number 37. Is that 37.8? Yes. Okay. What is that a picture of? Of uh, the little boy's legs. The front of the little boy's legs? That's correct. And in that photograph, were you documenting the lack of injury? 
Yes. Okay. The next photograph? Is a picture of the little boy at the back of his legs. In that photograph, were you also documenting the lack of injury? Yes. Okay. Next photo. Uh, it's a picture of the little boy's back and neck. Okay, and that's his, his entire back and neck. He doesn't have a shirt on, right? That's correct. Do you recall who it was that requested he take his shirt off? I don't recall. Did he already have his shirt off? Um, when you started taking your photographs? I don't recall that either. Okay. But at some point, we know by the time you were into the photographs, his shirt was off. That's correct. Okay. That particular photograph, what are you documenting there? I did not see any injury on his back or neck. Okay, and you were taking the photograph to, to um, record what you were seeing. That is a lack of injury. That's correct. Okay, next one. What is that a picture of? The little boy is uh, holding his right arm up, so right forearm. Why was he holding his right forearm up? I believe his right forearm was the one that was described as possibly having uh, some bruising, maybe like some grab marks. Okay, and that was Karen Wagner that told you that? That's correct. She said that the little boy had some bruising on his right forearm that she thought was grab marks? That's correct. You looked at his right forearm yourself before you took the photo, right? That's correct. And did you see something that you thought, based on your own experiences, looked like grab marks? I documented what I did see. Okay. And what was it that in you, my report? What was it that you did see? Um, let me find it here. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I write that I observed some minor red marks on his right forearm. One that I documented appeared to be an insect bite. Another that appeared to be maybe some sort of old scar. And then a third that I document did appear to be a small bruise. Okay, one small bruise. That's what I documented, yes. Do you recall the shape of that one small bruise? I do not. Do you recall thinking, oh wow, that looks like a grab mark? No. And if you had thought, you know, oh yeah, she's right, that would appear in your report. I would have documented that, yes. Okay. So we're reasonable when we review your report, we're reasonable in assuming that because you did not document these alleged grab marks, you didn't see them. Do you have mistakes to prove testimony? Also calls for speculation. Can you rephrase that? Sure. Can we have the question reread, please? When we review your report, we're reasonable in assuming that because you did not document these alleged grab marks, you did not see them. That's correct. I would have documented them. Okay. The next photo, please. What is that a picture of? It's a picture of the same right forearm, just closer up. Okay. Why were you taking a second uh, picture close up of the forearm? Either to document a different angle or a closer angle or something, because that was the alleged arm. Okay, and it was Karen Wagner that was making these allegations, the social worker? That's correct. Okay. Did you have a conversation as, you, as you're sitting here looking at this right arm? You see a bug bite, you see an old scar, you see a, a single bruise. That, that single bruise, it, it didn't look serious, did it? No. Okay, you see a single bruise, it doesn't look serious to you. At some point, did you turn to Miss Wagner and say, hey, lady, what are you talking about? Or something like that. I did not have a conversation with her about what I thought about the photographs or what I saw. I don't recall a conversation about that. Okay, do you recall having a thought about what was going on there? I documented what I thought I saw. So I... I understand. You, you documented what, what you saw, right? Yes. But oftentimes, you know, I, when I'm... I do a lot of documenting, believe me. But when I'm documenting things, there's things that I put into, you know, my narrative. And then there's things that I might think about or feel that I don't put in my narrative because they're not necessarily factual. They're not necessarily what's supposed to go there. So I leave them out. So that's what I'm looking for. I'm wondering, in your own mind, 
you're there. The social worker is making these allegations about these grab marks and these bruisings and all this stuff. You're looking at the kids, taking pictures, not seeing it. Did, the, did you have a thought that crossed your mind that maybe there was an issue with what this woman was saying? The social worker or uh, investigator, CPS investigator, was telling you. Objection asked and answered. Also requiring him to speculate and uh, facts assumed. I don't recall having that thought mm -hmm. about the CPS worker. I recall uh, looking at what was described and then noting in my report that what I thought it looked like. And I didn't necessarily think it looked like a grab mark. Okay. But you didn't have any thoughts about what the social worker, or rather the investigator, the CPS worker was telling you? No, I didn't have her information, so I, I, I didn't have, the, okay. I guess, the whole story. <clears throat> okay. And again, with respect to this particular close-up photo, you're documenting the insect bite, the old scar, and the small bruise, the single small bruise? That's correct. And can you do me a favor and for me circle on that photograph exactly where it was that you saw the single small bruise? Can I look at the previous photograph also? Absolutely. In fact, uh, if you could circle it on both, that would be great. I don't know what that pen is going to be like. Well, we'll wait and see. Give me that pen. This pen may work better. You can try that one, okay. but I think it's not going to write on the slick paper. The close-up kind of blurs a little bit, so it's, it's easy, a little easier to see some things on the one further away. But, sure. Um, it appears to me that. Okay. Yeah, the mark you placed was on exhibit 37.11, is that correct? Yes, it's 37.11. Okay, and that uh, circle that you drew for us, that is the area where you saw what um, appeared to you to be just a single small bruise. Yes, that's right. Okay. And that's the same single small bruise that you didn't feel was a serious injury. That's correct. Okay. Okay, this number 37.13, what's that, what's that a picture of? Uh, it appears to be a picture of his left forearm. And why were you taking a picture of his left forearm? <clears throat> Just, again, to document injury or lack of injury. And in this particular photograph, do you recall that you were documenting a lack of injury? Yes. Okay. There's no bruises in the, any there, anywhere there you were? I don't recall seeing any, and I don't, I don't see any in the photograph. Okay, and if there had been these grab mark bruises on his left arm, that's something you would have put in your report? That's correct. And it's also something you would have <clears throat> taken a picture of? That's correct. Okay, and turn to the next page. What is that a picture of? Uh, it's a picture of the same left forearm. Looks like possibly with a flash. Okay, and that's why it's kind of washed out? Yes. Okay. Do you recall why it was you were taking it with a flash? It's uh, quite possible that the flash came first. Oh, okay. And the picture quickly on the digital screen looked like that, and so I took a second photograph. Okay, so, so there's no other reason why you did it is because, <coughs> and I understand it, I'm looking at it, it's totally washed out. So you, is it your recollection that you first did it with the flash, couldn't see anything, and then adjusted it, turned off the flash, and then took a second picture? That's what would make sense to me now, yes. Okay. Do you remember doing that? No. Okay. But you do remember that when you did your own visual inspection of the little boy's left arm, you saw no bruises or injuries? That's correct. Okay. And if you had seen bruises or injuries, of course, those would have been documented in your report. That's correct. Okay. All right, you took your photos. About how long did that take? Not long. Min minutes. Okay, maybe less than five minutes? It's possible. Okay. And that less than five minutes, did that include your visual inspection of the children, or did you do the visual inspection first and then click the photo? I believe I was doing that simultaneously with taking the pictures. Okay. Both kids were cooperative? 
Yes. Okay, and this, this uh, 37.6, uh, little girl? Yes. Did she appear to you to be a child that was fearful or introverted in some way? She is smiling. Okay. She seemed happy. The photo appears that way, yes. Yeah. Well, you spent some time with her taking the photos. Was, was she a happy kid? I don't know if she was happy or not, but she was smiling. What was her demeanor? Did she seem like she's all right? There was no form of the question. She didn't seem fearful. Mm -hmm. And she didn't seem fearful of her parents either, did she? When she was standing there in that entryway with her mom and the uh, investigator, the Karen Wagner, and you know you and Officer Chestnut. She didn't seem fearful of her mom, did she? Yeah, I only witnessed her interaction with her mom, but I, I didn't see anything that stood out to me. Okay. And if you had seen something that stood out, like she was introverted or, or sort of closing down or even fearful of her mom, that's something you would have noted in your report, right? Yes. Okay. Looking at exhibit number 37, there's what appears to be an adult arm and a green shirt in that right-hand corner. You see that? Yes. Do you recall who that was? I don't. Okay. Do you recall there being an adult in the bathroom with you when you were taking these pictures? Yes. The, who, if you remember? I don't remember. It was, it was, let me ask you this. You look over at the lady sitting here to our left on the couch. Mm -hmm. You recognize her? Yes. Who's, who is that? That's Mrs. Pellon. You remember her being in the bathroom with you that night? I don't remember that it was her. Okay. Uh, that would make sense to me. Okay, then there's another photo, it's 37.7, and you can see the arm over on the right hand side, and then there's another adult over here on the left hand side wearing a pink shirt that looks like maybe slacks or dark jeans. You see that? Yes. Okay. Does that, reviewing that photo, does that refresh your recollection at all as to who might have been in the bathroom with you that <coughs> night? It doesn't. Okay. Do you recall whether or not Karen Wagner was in the bathroom with you? I don't recall whether she was or not. Okay. She certainly could have been. Okay. Do you recall whether or not as you were going through doing these photographs, she was pointing out and directing you um, what pictures to take of what areas on the body? No, I don't recall that. Okay. So you sort of made the decision on your own with these children what photos you would take? Yes, I just wanted general non-intrusive photos of, okay. that would document either injury or lack of injury like we discussed. Okay. Then once we finished with the, taking the photos in the bathroom, what happened next? Uh, I believe we went back outside. Okay. And when you say we, who's that? Uh, Officer Chestnut, myself, and I believe CPS worker also went outside. And where did you, did you go out the front door? I believe so. Where did you go from there? I believe there was uh, some of the people we discussed still standing in the driveway. Did the three of you then walk over and join that group in the driveway? I don't know that we joined them. Um, I think at that time I felt my involvement was concluding. Um, there was, uh, it was my understanding either through my conversation with the CPS worker or overhearing conversations that uh, the children were going to go with their grandfather. Do you know how that, or do you recall how that transition from home to grandfather's home for the children, how that came about? I don't. Um, it seemed that that was, had already been arranged before I even arrived on scene. What time did you arrive again? My report will indicate the time of the call that it, that it popped up on my MDC screen, uh, which was 8.30, 8.29. Then does the report also indicate what time you left? My general narrative doesn't indicate that. I, I'd have to search for it here through either some of the radio logs or... Sure, you can take a moment. Looks like the call was closed out, which doesn't... 
indicate that I had left at that time, but the call was closed out, and I and I added comments to the call, brief comments, at uh, 10:05. So you were there about an hour and a half or so. I don't. Again, I don't know if I was there. The 8:30 time is the time the call came on my screen. I don't know my response time or how long a call sits on the screen. I, I don't know that okay. looking at this. So um, that's a real rough sure. time frame. Sure. Because I don't know those parameters. And also uh, officers can clear from a call at a certain time and then it can be several minutes later or 15 or 20 minutes later whether they're gathering information or inputting more information or to close the call out. So okay, so there's a difference between when you clear from the call and when you close the call. That's correct. Okay. When did you clear from this call? It, that time doesn't look like it's documented right here. Okay. Do you know where that time would be documented? Is there like a dispatch log or dispatch record of some sort that would show when you called in to let them know you were done? There is there are uh, radio logs. Mm -hmm. um, so if I actually came on the radio and said that I'm clear from the residence, which I may or may not have done, I may have just cleared from the residence, and then you know uh, it's, it's common to just go down the street away from the incident and then do your stuff there. So yeah, um, we have some peace and quiet, just to get it done. Yeah, kind of unplug from the, the incident. Mm -hmm. Well, sitting here. Just sort of as we've been talking through and you're remembering the incident that evening and your involvement and the conversations and things that happened, can you give me, and I understand it's an estimate, but a general idea about how long you recall it was from the time you arrived on the scene until the time you stepped out, got in your car, and left? As I remember it, mm -hmm. it was not long. Um, I want to keep in, to take into account that there was like some standing around in the driveway. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there was some lag time in there, so that would go and in, come into play. But uh, it didn't seem long. It, looking back or thinking back, it seemed short, half hour. And again, I, I recognize that's just an estimate. During that half hour period, we've had a couple conversations uh, that you participated in with the CPS worker. And then you witnessed a few conversations between the CPS worker and others, but you don't necessarily recall exactly the substance of those conversations, right? Right. Okay. Do you recall, um, whether it be out in the driveway or at some other place, probably out in the driveway if you recall at all, uh, you'll tell me. The CPS worker telling either one of the parents words to the effect of, you've got two choices. You let the children go with the grandfather, or I'm going to take them and put them in foster care. Do you recall? I don't recall hearing that, no. Is that something you would have written in your report if you heard it? Possibly. Okay, but not necessarily. Not necessarily. Okay, because taking the children or not taking the children, that's not your business that night. That was not my business that night. Okay. Going back to exhibit number 51, just for a moment, uh, page 0036. Okay, about the middle of the page or so, um, it talks about abused children and the policy and procedure about how you're supposed to deal with the situation when you're called out on a call and there's an allegation that a child's been abused, right? Yes, that's what this is. Yes. And one of the things that you're supposed to do is allow the parents to explain how the injury may have occurred and document their statements in a report, right? Yes, if I'm there investigating, mm -hmm. that would be something, yes. What is a DR? Uh, it's a daily report, so this report is a, is a DR. Okay. Is there a difference, difference between a daily report and a departmental report? No. It's the same thing. And I may have just misspoke I, on, the, on sure. exactly what that means. Yeah, no, no problem. It's the same. We're talking about just one report. That's correct. Okay. And it says here, if an emergency situation exists and the child's welfare is in immediate danger, 
with the approval of an on-duty supervisor, take the child into custody. First, did I read that correctly? Yes. Okay, and, and that's going back to that concept we talked about earlier where you have to have reasonable and articulable evidence to show that the child is in immediate danger of suffering severe bodily injury or death. That's where you would step in, talk to your on-duty supervisor, and take the child into custody. Yes. Okay, and that's according to the training that was provided to you by the city of Buckeye? Yes. Did the city of Buckeye ever give you any training regarding whether or not, as a police officer, if you see a citizen's constitutional rights being violated in your presence, you have a duty to intercede to prevent that? Have you ever had that kind of training? <clears throat> I would say as a other members of my department or of a law enforcement, mm -hmm. yes. Okay, and that's sort of what you're thinking of right now, correct me if I'm wrong, is sort of in the context of an excessive force situation where you see one of your fellow officers just beating the snot out of some guy. You might think, hey, he's going too far. I need to step in, intervene, intercede, and stop it. Objection to Foreman Foundation. Yes, uh, another officer violating any constitutional right. Right. Have you ever had any uh, training that that duty to intercede applies to other governmental officers besides just your fellow police officers? Just for speculation. And foundation. I don't recall any training mm -hmm. that would uh, suggest that. And I, I would just say we because we don't have their information on how they operate. So I well, that sort of makes sense. <clears throat> the next paragraph down here says, if no emergency situation exists, contact Child Protective Services, CPS, to determine if a caseworker will respond to remove the child and if there are prior CPS incidents. First, did I read that correctly? Yes. Now, we already know that if there's an emergency, meaning there's imminent danger to the child, that the child is going to suffer severe physical injury, you can take the child with your supervisor's approval. We don't need CPS. That's correct. Okay. If there's no emergency, there's no imminent danger to the child, that's what we're talking about here, right? Yes. Okay. So if there's no imminent danger to the child, then, then you won't remove the child. You'll call CPS. That is standard procedure, yes. Okay, and then CPS will come out and because the way this reads, it seems like once you call CPS, they are going to remove that child. So I, I'm wondering, to what's your... To, it says to determine. Oh, no, hold on, hold on. Well, it says to deter. If no emergency situation exists, contact CPS to determine if a caseworker will respond to remove the child. So if they respond at all, they're going to remove the child? Is that the correct understanding? Section Facts. Foreman Foundation. I guess I don't know what they're trying to say okay. there. All right. Well, what, what's your understanding of, of how this is supposed to work? I mean, I, I'm a little bit confused by the statement. It seems when I read it, it's a foregone conclusion that if you call CPS and they end up coming out there, they're going to remove that kid. Objection to Foreman Foundation. <coughs> so facts call speculation. Go ahead and explain That's not under. standard okay, procedure. Okay, that's not standard. Can you explain to me what the standard procedure is? <coughs> also objection to Foreman Foundation. Standard would be to, to make the call to CPS and let them investigate and determine what needs to happen at that point okay. with and the children. And you don't um, have any understanding based on your training and experience whether these same rules apply to CPS with respect to the emergency, the requirement that there be an emergency situation to remove the kid without Direction. a warrant. Hey, hold on a second, Sorry. let me ask the question again because we've got to get clean on the video. Based on your training and experience, you don't have any understanding whether or not CPS is required to follow the same rules as you are with respect to moving a child, removing a child from its parents. That is, that in order to do it without a court order or warrant, there must be imminent danger of serious physical injury. 
objection to form information? I do not have any understanding of what their requirements are. Okay. What is, if you turn to the last page, 00037, what is ARS towards the bottom of the page? What is ARS 13-3623? What is that? ARS is Arizona Revised Statutes. Okay. And that 13-3623 is the specific statute that they're talking about. Okay, are you familiar with that statute? I would have to look it up okay. to know exactly what it is. Are you familiar with um, any of the criteria that you're to apply in physical abuse cases? Uh, yes, those that are outlined here in the, in the policy. You're familiar with those? Yes. Okay. When you were inspecting these children and taking photos of them, looking for bruises, bumps, marks, injuries, things like that, did you see anything there that would have fallen into one of these criteria? See any strap marks or abrasions or contusions? Again, I, I wasn't there investigating. It was sure. a, a little bit of a, a different incident um, than I'm, I think what they're talking about right here. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't drawing my own conclusions. Sure. Uh, but as I indicated, I, I didn't witness any serious injury. Okay, and if you had, we'd see it. That's correct. Okay. I've marked and I'm showing you uh, exhibit number 29. If you can just take a moment and sort of look through that document, it begins with Bates number 1052 and continues through 1059. Okay, have you taken a moment to look through that? Yes. What is that document, or is it more than one document? <clears throat> uh, it's the department report that we discussed earlier. Okay, so this is the report of the time you spent out at the Pellerin home on May 10th, 2013? That's correct. Okay. Is this a report that you um, at least provided the data for? Not all, but... Mm -hmm. Some, yes. Okay. What part of it is your data? <clears throat> what I enter starts on uh, 01053. It's about halfway down where it says involvements. Involvements, I'm not seeing. Oh, I see it. Okay, yes. And then continue on. 01054 to 01055. That is the information that I enter into that report. Okay, and then everything beyond that is somebody else. It's either generated by the computer or dispatch or somebody. Okay. That. On 1053, if you look, uh, the second to the last entry there says victim interviews. <clears throat> Who were the victims here? This information in the involvements mm -hmm. is not limited to more than just I can add to the involvements of this case. Um, so that, that could be maybe interviews that happened at a later time. Another officer, oh, if there the was follow-up or or something else, then they can also enter involvements into that. Okay, there's, I, I noticed there's a date column on the far left-hand side of this page. Yeah, and that's not my entry. Okay, can you identify for me, use a pen and just sort of mark which ones are your entries? So... The names of the people involved. That's all you. And that the audio, or the CD at the bottom. The CD, audio, and photos. Yes. Okay, and the audio, that was the uh, audio of the conversation between you, <coughs> you, a military personnel, and Ms. Wagner? Yes. Okay, thank you. And then the photos, of course. Yes. Okay. If we turn to the next page, 1054, and I guess 1054 through 1055, is that, what is that? Uh, that's the body of my report, the narrative portion of my report, where I describe what happened. Okay, so this is the area where, for instance, if we wanted to find out if you saw what you believe was a serious injury, we would find that here in this narrative body. That's correct. Okay. Or if you saw grab marks or didn't see grab marks or a you know, 
lacerations, whatever injury, that would be here if you saw it. That's correct. Okay. As part of your training, are you trained that in putting together this report, the narrative, you know, rendition of what happened, that you're supposed to include all relevant information? Yes. Okay. You don't, you don't leave things out that might be important? No. Okay. Part of the reason for that is because people are going to look at this later and rely on what you're saying here as being truthful, honest, and accurate, right? That's correct. Okay. And it's important that we be able to look at your narrative and, and take it as being truthful, honest, and accurate, right? Yes. Why is that important? Objection to form and foundation. To you, why would that be important? Objection to form and foundation. If it wasn't accurate information, I, I, your word wouldn't be good for much if you established a pattern of not putting appropriate information in your reports. It's a good answer. I agree with you, 100%. I'm going to show you what was previously marked to another deposition, and we'll mark it again as an exhibit to your deposition. It's exhibit number 11 there in front of you. And gentlemen, I apologize. I only have my copy. Um, Jim, you should have yours yeah, from yesterday. I don't know if I have it. What, just, what was 11 reminding me? Number 11. What, I mean, what was it? Oh, it's the forensic medical examination. Okay. And it's the forensic medical examination of Kaysen Pellerin. <clears throat> If you could look at the first paragraph there under referral, it says referred by Sergeant Hayman of the Buckeye Police. See that there? Yes. Do you know this person? Yes. Okay. Is he with a particular unit? At the time, um, I believe Sergeant Hayman was in charge of uh, a unit that deals with crimes against children and child abuse. A part of the child protection team? Yes. Do you have a unit called child protection team? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. Do you know, and you may not know this, but do you know whether as part of its regularly established procedures and policies, the Buckeye Police Department um, refers children suspected of being victims of child abuse to Phoenix Children's Hospital for forensic examinations. I don't know. Okay. Do you know whether or not, as a matter of custom and practice, the city of Buckeye refuse or refers all of the children that it deals with who are suspected of being abused to this facility for a forensic medical evaluation. I don't know that. Do you know whether or not as a matter of standard custom and practice every child that the city of Buckeye refers to this medical facility ends up getting a sex abuse examination. I don't know. I don't know. Do you know who would know that? Uh, possibly Sergeant Heyman. Okay. Anybody else besides Sergeant Heyman? Uh, it's possible that some of the detectives that work under Sergeant Heyman would know that. Okay. How many detectives work in that unit, if you know? I believe there's two right now. And I didn't ask you this, I just assumed it is, is Sergeant Heyman a man or a woman? A man. Okay. Looking at uh, page 478 mm -hmm. of Exhibit 11, and if you go down to um, genitourinary exam, where it says examined in the supine position, on examination of the shaft and glands, no deformities or signs of injury are noted. First, did I read that correctly? Yes. Now, you're the father of 
I thought you said two little boys. You have a couple girls and a couple boys? I have three boys. Three boys, I'm sorry. Um, I, I guess I didn't ask the question. I just assumed it's two and two. But three little boys. Based on your experience as a parent, would that be emotionally traumatic for a little boy to have his penis examined by a stranger? Objection to form and foundation. Calls for speculation, relevance. Go ahead. Uh, possibly, yes. Yeah. Uh, certainly the child wouldn't like it. Objection to speculation. form and foundation. Calls for speculation. I would doubt that. I mean, I'm an adult and I wouldn't like it, but. How about the testimony? Objection to form and foundation moved to strike counsel's editorial comments. I agree with that, withdrawn. <clears throat> How about the testicles? Would it, based on your experience as a parent of three little boys, would it be emotionally uncomfortable for the child to have a stranger examine their testicles? Objection to form and foundation. Relevance and uh, calls for speculation. Yes. And the anus. How about the anus in the supine knee chest position? Do you think, you know, as a parent of three little boys, that that could be emotionally traumatic for a little boy? Objection to form and foundation. Speculation. It certainly could be. Okay. Do you have any understanding as to whether or not the government needs a warrant before they do this type of examination to a child? Objection to form and foundation. It is not a common practice on a patrol level, so I, I don't know. You wouldn't. But you on the patrol level, you're not permitted to do these sorts of physical examinations without a warrant, right? Objection to form and foundation. Uh, correct. Yeah. I believe we're done. I just have Thank a few. Thank you very much. <laughs>